Hello everyone, welcome back to the Key Concepts in Kafka tutorial. In the last video, we took a deep dive into some foundational concepts like topics, producers, consumers, offsets, and partitions. Today, we're going to explore more advanced consumer-related concepts, including offset commits, partition assignments, rebalancing, and consumer groups. These concepts are not only key to understanding Kafka's internal workings, but also crucial for using Kafka more effectively in real-world projects. In the previous video, we talked about consumer offsets. A consumer internally tracks the offset for a specific topic partition. Every time the consumer reads a message, it provides Kafka with the offset, indicating where to start reading. After reading a message, the consumer increments the offset to prepare for the next one. Typically, Kafka's consumer client handles this offset increment automatically. However, there's a potential issue. If the consumer crashes unexpectedly, it might lose its progress and not know where it left off when it restarts. To prevent this, Kafka supports offset commit. In simple terms, after consuming messages, the consumer submits the current offset to the Kafka server for storage. Kafka internally stores these offsets in a special topic called underscore underscore consumer underscore offsets. This topic keeps track of the offsets consumers have committed for each topic and partition. So, if a consumer crashes and restarts, Kafka can inform it of the last consumed message, allowing it to pick up where it left off. There are two main approaches to committing offsets, depending on the timing. In the first approach, the consumer commits the offset before processing the message. This ensures that messages are consumed at most once, but it can lead to lost messages. For example, imagine a topic called Topic A with a single partition, P0. There's a consumer, C1, with an internal offset of 3. After reading two messages, D and E, the offset becomes 5. If C1 commits this offset before processing the messages and then crashes, Kafka will tell C1 that its progress is at offset 5 when it restarts. Since D and E weren't processed, these messages are lost. This is known as at most once semantics. Due to the risk of lost messages, this method is generally not recommended. The second approach is for the consumer to process the messages first and then commit the offset once the processing is complete. This prevents message loss, but can result in duplicate consumption. For instance, C1 reads messages D and E, updates its internal offset to 5, and then successfully processes the messages. If C1 crashes before committing the offset, Kafka will still report its progress as 3 after the restart, causing C1 to reread and reprocess D and E, leading to duplicate consumption. This approach is called at least once semantics. It ensures no messages are lost, but allows for duplicates. This method is common in practice because it guarantees reliability. However, to handle potential duplicate messages, the processing logic needs to be idempotent, meaning even if the same message is processed multiple times, the result remains the same. Kafka also supports exactly once semantics, where each message is processed exactly once, without loss or duplication. However, this is more complex to implement and use. Kafka's Streams API and Transactional Producers Consumers support this feature, but it's considered an advanced topic, which we won't dive into in this tutorial. Offset commits can be automatic or manual. By setting enable.auto.commit equals true, the consumer will automatically commit the offsets. By default, it commits every five seconds, which can be adjusted with the auto.commit.interval.mis parameter. Automatic commits are convenient and offer the best performance, but they may lead to message loss or duplication because the timing of the commit isn't fully under your control. This method is suitable for scenarios where message reliability is not critical. If you need more control over when to commit offsets, you can disable automatic commits and use commit sync to commit offsets manually. This ensures that offsets are only committed after successful message processing, reducing the risk of message loss. However, this method is slower and can still result in duplicate consumption in extreme cases. There's also an asynchronous commit option, commit async, 
which offers better performance but increases the likelihood of duplicate consumption. When Kafka introduces multiple partitions, consumer handling becomes more complex. One challenge is how to distribute partitions as evenly as possible among multiple consumers. Let's use Topic A as an example to explain. Before we get started, let's quickly mention consumer groups. We'll discuss this concept in detail later, but for now, imagine multiple consumers working together as part of the same group, aiming toward the same business goal. In Kafka, partition assignment follows three basic rules. Rule number one, a partition can only be consumed by one consumer at a time. In other words, no two consumers are allowed to consume the same partition simultaneously. For instance, if there are three partitions, P0, P1, and P2, and three consumers, C1, C2, and C3, it's valid for C1 to consume P0, C2 to consume P1, and C3 to consume P2. But if both C2 and C3 attempt to consume P2, that would violate the rule, leading to message duplication or loss. Rule number two, a consumer can consume multiple partitions at the same time. For example, if there's only one consumer, C1 and three partitions, P0, P1 and P2, C1 can consume all three partitions without any resource conflicts. Similarly, if there are two consumers, C1 and C2, and four partitions, P0, P1, P2, and P3, C1 might consume P0 and P1, while C2 consumes P2 and P3. This is a valid distribution. Rule number three, a consumer may temporarily not consume any partitions. When there are more consumers than partitions, some consumers may have no work. For instance, if there are two partitions, P0 and P1, but three consumers, C1, C2, and C3, C1 might consume P0, C2 might consume P1, while C3 remains idle. This is not wasteful, though, as C3 can quickly take over if C1 or C2 fails, ensuring high availability. Additionally, if a consumer is assigned multiple partitions, it needs to track separate offsets for each partition. You can think of each consumer having virtual pointers for every partition, indicating where the consumption is at any given moment. For example, C1 may be consuming from P0 and P1, with an offset of 3 in P0 and 6 in P1. As messages are consumed, these offsets increase, like the consumer's pointer moving forward. In Kafka, partition assignment for consumers can be a complex process, but fortunately, Kafka handles it automatically. As the number of consumers changes, Kafka adjusts the assignment of partitions to consumers, balancing the workload as evenly as possible. This process is called consumer rebalancing. Let's walk through an example to see how it works. Imagine we have a topic, topic A, with three partitions, P0, P1, and P2. Initially, the data load is light, so we only need one consumer, C1, which consumes all three partitions at the same time. As the data load increases, C1 can no longer keep up. So we add a new consumer, C2. At this point, Kafka triggers a consumer rebalance. When the rebalance begins, Kafka instructs C1 to pause its work, commit the current offsets for each partition, and wait for new partition assignments. Then, Kafka continues the rebalancing process. After the rebalance, let's say the new partition assignments are that C1 will continue consuming P0 and P1, while C2 starts consuming P2. Kafka informs C1 and C2 of their new assignments along with the committed offsets for each partition, and they start consuming again. Later, the data load increases even more, so we add a third consumer, C3. After another rebalance, Kafka assigns P0 to C1, P1 to C2, and P2 to C3. Now the three partitions are evenly distributed across the three consumers. One night, C2 suddenly goes offline, leaving only C1 and C3. Kafka immediately detects this change in the number of consumers and triggers another rebalance. This time, C1 is assigned P0 and P1, while C3 takes over P2. The next day, the ops team fixes C2 and brings it back online. 
This triggers another rebalance, and Kafka reassigns the partitions. C1 gets P0, C2 gets P1, and C3 gets P2. To improve availability and ensure sufficient processing capacity, the ops team decides to add a backup consumer, C4. Now, with more consumers than partitions, Kafka doesn't trigger a rebalance since all partitions are already assigned. C4 remains idle, consuming no partitions. Later, C3 goes offline, and Kafka quickly triggers another rebalance. After this rebalance, C1 consumes P0, C2 consumes P1, and C4 takes over P2. This way, even if one consumer goes down, the system can still maintain normal partition consumption. That's the role of the backup consumer. To summarize, there are several situations that can trigger a consumer rebalance in Kafka. The first is when consumers are added or removed. This could happen when the ops team manually scales the number of consumers, when a consumer goes offline, or when network issues cause a consumer to temporarily disconnect and then rejoin the group. The second is during rolling updates of the consumer group. As each consumer goes offline, updates, and comes back online, it may trigger frequent rebalances. As you can see, rebalancing is a relatively costly operation. During a rebalance, the affected consumers must pause for a while, leading to what's known as the stop the world problem. To address this issue, starting from version 2.3, Kafka introduced cooperative rebalancing. This mechanism allows consumers to continue consuming from partitions that aren't being reassigned, even as the rebalance process redistributes some partitions. This helps reduce overall downtime and prevents a complete halt in consumption. In real-world applications, the same Kafka topic often serves different business needs. For example, take the orders topic. Different departments might have their own consumer applications. Let's say the fulfillment department needs to process orders for shipping. They could have a consumer app called Orders for Fulfillment that pulls order data into their system to handle shipments. Meanwhile, the customer service team might need to look up order details when customers report issues. They might have a consumer app called Orders for Customer Service that fetches order data for their system. The recommendation team could use customers' historical order data to suggest new products. So, they might have an Orders for Recommendation consumer app that processes orders to feed into the recommendation engine. You might wonder, how can all these different consumers read from the same topic without interfering with each other? The answer is through consumer groups. In Kafka, the consumer group is the fundamental unit of rebalancing and partition assignment. In other words, different consumer groups are completely isolated from each other in Kafka's eyes. Let's look at an example to understand how consumer groups work. Imagine we have a topic called Topic A with three partitions, P0, P1, and P2. We have two different consumer applications, App1 and App2, both reading from Topic A, but serving different business needs. We assign each of these consumer applications a different consumer group ID, say Group 1 for App1 and Group 2s for App2. In consumer group 1, there are three consumers, C11, C12, and C13. After rebalancing, C11 is assigned P0, C12 is assigned P1, and C13 is assigned P2. In consumer group 2, there are two consumers, C21 and C22. After rebalancing, C21 is assigned both P0 and P1, while C22 is assigned P2. At this point, you may notice that consumers in both groups are reading from the same partitions. So how are they kept isolated from each other? The answer is simple. Each consumer group tracks its own offsets independently. To make it easier to understand, think of each consumer in a group having a virtual pointer on its assigned partition that tracks its progress. For example, in group one, C11 may have its offset on partition P0 at 3, C12 might be at offset 5 on P1, and C13 might be at offset 2 on P2. Meanwhile, in group 2, C21 could have an offset of 5 on P0 and 4 on P1, 
while C22 is at offset 7 on P2. This means that even though both groups are consuming from the same partitions, their progress is tracked independently, so they don't interfere with each other. After understanding concepts like offset commits, consumer rebalancing, and consumer groups, it becomes clear that when a consumer submits an offset to Kafka, it needs to provide four key pieces of information. The consumer group, the topic, the partition, and the offset. These four elements act like four-dimensional coordinates, precisely indicating where a consumer group is in its consumption of a specific partition within a topic. It's important to note that these coordinates don't include individual consumers like C11 or C21, as those consumers can change over time. Kafka dynamically assigns consumers to partitions through rebalancing as changes occur. As we know, Kafka stores these offsets in a special internal topic called consumer offsets. To track them accurately, Kafka uses the same four-dimensional coordinates when recording offsets. This allows Kafka to monitor each consumer group's progress and determine where each consumer should resume after rebalancing. This also explains why the consumer group is the fundamental unit of Kafka's rebalancing and partition assignment process. Different consumer groups are completely isolated from each other, with each group managing its own consumption independently. Lastly, it's crucial to assign different consumer group IDs to consumer apps with different business goals. If two applications accidentally use the same consumer group ID, Kafka will treat them as part of the same group. In that case, Kafka will split partition assignments between them, meaning each app will only get part of the data, not all of it. If you found this lesson helpful, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to the Byte Vigor channel so you won't miss out on more exciting content in the future. See you in the next video.